Good morning and welcome to Eye of the River, a webinar hosted by Ormston House, the Limerick partner on this Creative Europe project, Memory of Water. My name is Mary Conlon and I'm the artistic director of this project. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar, Memory of Water is a two-year artist-led project exploring waterfront heritage zones in the context of community development and urban planning. Uh, we're a team of artists and partners from uh, six cities across Europe, and we are also council members of the River Cities Platform Foundation. So this is how the partners uh, met and connected. Uh, my principal role in the project is to support the artists uh, through an international residency program to make work in Govan in Scotland, in Gdansk in Poland and in Levadia in Greece. And another um, uh, activity that uh, I was to um, support or host was the artist gathering uh, which unfortunately was due was scheduled for April of this year and unfortunately had to be cancelled. And because of this, um, I want to start uh, with a sort of an introduction to Limerick City for for uh, visitors here today to the webinar, but also to the artists and partners who actually couldn't come to Limerick in person. And I thought it was really important to explain why I felt Limerick was the perfect partner location on this. Uh, project. So first of all, I, Limerick is the perfect city because we have a really strong arts community. We have the Limerick School of Art and Design, Eva International, which is Ireland's biennial of uh, visual art. We have a municipal gallery with fine national collections, for example. But we also have brilliant community-focused and community-led arts initiatives across all art forms and in all areas of the city and the periphery of the city. Um, we were also at the inaugural National City of Culture in 2014. And I think this was a very, um, this was a great opportunity for people to see the contribution that artists make to the image perception of a place, to quality of life, to critical thinking. And I think this was really shown through the surveys and studies that were published afterwards. In particular, one of my favorites was the social impact study, which was led by citizen researchers. So it was written from the perspective of citizens who had participated in the program uh, for the year. Um, the second reason I think Limerick was the perfect city is because we have a history of really effective community activism. Uh, this first image here is um, from the archive of Deirdre Power and Andrew Carney, so two local artists. And in the 1980s, they were student activists. Um, and here they were sort of highlighting the growing public um, sort of frustration with the slow planning process in the city. So a third bridge was due to be uh, constructed in, in the city to ease congestion and also to connect different parts of the city. And there was a very long drawn out process. So here they decided uh, to gather a group of students together and they went down to the river and they installed their own bridge as a, a form of protest, but also an, an awareness campaign. And of course we have a lot of current uh, uh, activism and activist groups as well. So here we have Swimmable Limerick, which is really encouraging people to really uh, get back into the water and start swimming. There was a, quite a long period where people were, because of the tidal river, were, were, were unsure of how to get into the water safely. And now there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of acti activism, there's a lot of events and, and training around that. So there's a lot more people in the, in the water than there was even say 10 years ago. Um, other examples of community activism are Limerick Against Pollution, the Limerick Cycling Campaign, the Limerick Pedestrian Network, all led by citizens, all really committed to uh, an extended period of time of campaigning and all for the improvement and the betterment of the city. So there's already a very strong community and citizen led activism happening in the city. Um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about public consultation. So this has been a really interesting point across all the cities involved in this partnership. The public consultation is, can be problematic, that there are maybe some voices that aren't heard, some communities that aren't engaged, or that these voices are engaging, but they're not being heard or, or listened to. And there are definitely very good examples and also not so good examples in Limerick of this happening. Uh, but this seems to have been the case across all our partners. Um, and this 
um, summer, people in Ireland will be aware that there were new guidelines to public consultation published by central government. And there's a really great example in Limerick of the Urban Innovation Department, um, which are taking a different approach to the sort of statutory and non-statutory consultation process that we're more familiar with. So they're starting with focus groups, they're identifying key stakeholders, residents, different groups to get lots of different perspectives. And this is how they begin a project. So they start the project by talking to people on the ground um, in the city, whereas we're more used to a master planning process and initial talking document being presented before anybody is, is, is approached. So this is something that, um, is an interesting uh, approach. Um, and another reason why Limerick is a, an ideal city is we have this uh, Limerick 2030 company, which is set up by Limerick City and County Council. So this is the biggest infra built infrastructure project outside the capital in the history of the state. So Limerick has identified key sites around the city that they are uh, managing and redeveloping. And the one that we're particularly interested in here is what is going to be the Cleves Riverside campus. And Limerick City and County Council, our local government, has recently just announced an amazing project management team who are entering this master planning uh, phase. So then I wanted to share with you a map of Limerick just to give you an idea of just how important the river is to this place. And I have just selected some of the sites, uh, the waterfront heritage sites, that are currently at, at different phases have been redeveloped along the city. So as you can see, there are quite a lot and there, uh, some are private, some are public, some are in state ownership, for example. Um, so up here we have the Corbally Baths which is a, an historic site, but that has fallen into disrepair. And there's a lot of community activism around this project to get it um, back up and running. Um, here we have the Thomond Weir. There's a former um, salmon packing factory there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on with the artist, Mary Conroy. So this has just passed into the ownership of the local government. Here we have Lockheed Bridge and at Lockheed Bridge we have a small historic lodge as well and this is actually now being taken on by another European project in which the local government is uh, the Irish partner. Um, this project is the recovery and valorization of maritime, military and industrial heritage of the Atlantic coast area. Um, and they are looking to do some restoration, conservation, preservation works on this building. So I think people local will be really, really happy to um, see this um, beautiful building restored and also they plan to put it into use. Unfortunately, this, this is a, a sadder story. So there's an historic Kurigara house, which there was some lobbying to try and put it onto the protected structures list. Unfortunately, that was not successful and this building has fallen into disrepair and will be knocked down. Um, then further down into the city, we have the former Dunn Stores supermarket, which was lying empty and unused for decades um, and had really become an eyesore in the city. And recently, the University of Limerick has purchased the site. And the University of Limerick, which you'll see on the map, is based out here. So quite disconnected from the city. They are now planning a city centre campus. So this will be transformative for the city as well. And that is right on the water edge as well. And then, of course, down here, we have the Limerick docks. And there is a master plan, the 2041 master plan that has been developed there. They've done extensive environmental surveys. Uh, planning and published a very, very interesting master plan. They're right opposite the Westfield um, wetlands, which we'll get to in a moment as well. So and realizing again through this project how lucky we are to have these working docks. So the plan of the master plan is to actually to expand the operations of the Limerick docks in the city. And it's really an iconic site. Um, and my hope is that actually the space will open up a lot more to the, the public. There's currently like a high wall that kind of blocks it. But it, from the other side of the river, there's just this magnificent view of that, um, of that site. Um, and so as you can see that there's a lot of at different points, a lot of different uh, buildings and waterfront sites that are looking to be redeveloped. 
Um, and so much so that actually there's so much planning happening in Limerick at the moment, which, as I say, makes it a perfect city to partner on this project. But also, you know, I, I, I've thrown this in for fun, but a number of years ago, a satirical newspaper actually published this um, uh, this article kind of poking fun at all these new plans and artistic visions that were coming out of Limerick because there was so much, uh, you know, planning and um, uh, aspirations, I suppose, been, been published and shared publicly. So they, they were poking fun at us uh, for all our various plans. So another reason why I think Limerick is an ideal partner location on this is that actually we're, it's, it's a green city. It's 30% green space. There's a lot of wild space in the, uh, in the city. There's a lot of green space in the city um, as well as special areas of uh, conservation, um, a lot of public parks. I mentioned briefly the Westfield wetlands, which is a special area of uh, conservation. And it's something that we're very proud here. And in this image here, you just get an idea of just how, how green the city is. Um, and, you know, we, we really embrace the, the kind of wild spaces in, in the city as well. So I think that's a real asset uh, to us. Um, and as you will see further down on this Isle of Limerick uh, article, you'll see again that there, there are experts drawing up a management plan. And again, there is an opportunity here to take a survey, to engage with the local government's consultation portal, to share your ideas and have input into the future management of this space. So a person who I think has been really instrumental in not only Limerick winning this European Green City Award and also the conservation and preservation is a man called Pat Lysett, who's probably the person we have learned the most about the river and was recently acknowledged and honoured by, um, by the city through a mayoral reception for his contribution to protecting the green spaces in the city. And he is one of the people who would have um, met with our European colleagues um, for the artist gathering and we would have taken a trip up the river with them and because you couldn't come we have made this short film to see the river and the city from his perspective so uh, along with the local artist Shane Serrano of Crude Media uh, we took a short trip up the river together to give you a feel or a sense of the city uh, so without further ado I will share this with you <laughs> Hi, Maria. <coughs> no. Right, is he wounded? Right, right, he's not well. Uh, listen, I, I'll, I'll check him out maybe later on. He's at the start of the Shannon Fields, I see. Yeah, okay, see you so. See you later. Bye, bye, bye. Swan in distress up in the Shannon Fields. That was my daughter. And there's other swans around him, like probably bothering him. He was probably attacked. But uh, I'll check it out later on. Then she's afraid maybe dogs would come down and have a go off him, you know, so. And how come you always get those kind of calls? Uh, I used to, I was doing it the last 40 years nearly. 37 actually but it's it has lingered on <laughs> and uh, they still call me I'll check it out you're saying when you used to do it for nearly 40 years you did it as a job no not at all <laughs> it wasn't paid for it <laughs> uh, no I did it when I was called I could be called at four in the morning by the guards and the public the Limerick Provincial Cruelty to Animals, uh, any of those organisations, you know what I mean? And uh, I'd nearly go straight away. The, the guards was the most interesting ones because they used to be holding up traffic. And here I am in the middle of traffic and all the traffic stopped and me trying to catch this yoke, <laughs> you know. 
So that's what I do. So I've, I've done hundreds, I'd say. Why did you do it? What responsibility did you feel? <laughs> felt I'm obliged to do it because people ask me to. <laughs> and I like wildlife anyway, you know what I mean? Have you got apprentices? No, there's no one going to do what I do. <laughs> You're one of a kind. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Not this in the same sense, if you know what I mean. I don't think so. This will be a lovely time of the year now soon, lads. We'll have all the, the leaves coming down, you know. And then I know it is winter. You know, I love the seasons. I see the changes, you know. Well, it's lovely and still this morning. The, there's a heron over on the seat. See him over on the seat? <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you, you didn't see that from back there. Well, now, I can see things because just taking the view of the river, something out of place. Oh, what's that? You know what I mean? We you know so well. We know, yeah. Actually, he's at the landing now there about, what, about 1,100 metres away. The, you might be asking how old are you? What would you say? I'm not afraid to tell you. <laughs> but I'm afraid to guess. <laughs> <laughs> afraid to insult me. <laughs> I'll be 78 Christmas. And what's keeping you young, would you say? Fresh air, out in the open. Hey. Well, lads. Huh? No buy a boat. <laughs> you see, that's the best of this boat. A big boat is no good to me. Right? I couldn't do that. I can go where I like, when I like. Big boats, they're out in the open, you know, and, and I say, I'd love to be in there. I said, you know, I can go right into the wall or anything, you know, but big boats, I wouldn't take a present to one. <laughs> How are you, lads? We're not speeding. It's a perfect morning for it, lads, Absolutely. you know. Um, uh, he's filming, I don't know what he's filming, he's filming you actually. <laughs> <laughs> Pulled up by the guards, speeding ticket. <laughs> they shouted at me anyway. That the, a man had fallen in here, under the bridge. Now whether he fell in, or jumped in, we don't know. But, I said, I'll get him, and I rushed over, and he was splashing and sparking, and I caught him by the, I could see his belt, and I whoosh, pulled him in, no bother. I, I don't know where the strength came from, but he wasn't a heavy man anyway, he was only about, I'd say about 10 or 12 stone, if you, yeah, about that, 11 maybe. But uh, I pulled him in, and I brought him down there near classes or steps, and, uh, he went to get out of the boat and I said, hang on there, hang on there, so I have to report this. She's like, you know, and he slipped on the steps, they were slippy. And I said, fix sake, says I, sit down, you'll kill yourself now. But the ambulance came anyway and all that jazz and the uh, fire service and uh, they took him away. It has got very bad. There wasn't that many thrown it in back in my time. Now, be Jesus, they're all at it there. Hello there. There's a woman with a dog. Um, what do you think has changed, Carson, to your day? People bothered, they're, you know, struggling to make ends meet, I think. And, you know, everybody owes money, it seems, and 
they're bothered as well. Even farmers, you know the usual now. But the feckin' government has us robbed. It is wrong. Do you think people were happier back, back in the day? Yeah. We all had nothing. <laughs> 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 nothing. Borrowing sugar off the woman next door. Sup of milk, a bit of sugar. Bring that back to Mrs. Power, I was told. So you think with more, more possessions comes more sadness? Yeah. You know, people want more. They can't have it. Wait till you see this guy. Get a picture of him. <laughs> Tom, do you, do you ever hear me saying, I'll be rich and famous? Famous me arse. <laughs> yes, I always say that. You couldn't buy it. Money isn't the thing at all. Peace of mind. I'll see you, Tom. I'm on a mission. <laughs> I love the place, if you know me, because I was alongside the river all my life. Oh, I say I have a photograph when I was four years of age rowing a boat. <laughs> I have a daughter in the Caribbean and I, we were there four or five times and I wouldn't be bothered with it. I'd be, I'd be anxious to come back, I'd miss something. <laughs> in case I miss something. So that's what I do. People ask me for help and I help them. The richest man in Ireland. Uh, Pat Lysis truly is a local hero and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank him for teaching us so much about the river and for always being so obliging in bringing our visitors out on the river. It really is a spectacular way to see the city. So I have covered why I think Limerick is the perfect city to partner on this Memory of Water project. And in our Memory of Water podcast series, um, so much are published um, this month. The artists and curators are interviewed this month. And in January, I will be covering the practical steps. So going into more detail on how uh, Ormson House became involved in the project, covering frequently asked questions that I get. But today, the question I get asked the most is how did you find your partners? And that was through the River Cities Platform Foundation, which we applied to uh, join in 2017. And shortly after, we received an email with questions about um, waterfront heritage. And we were invited to a meeting at the Baltic Sea Cultural Centre to discuss this further and to plan an application to Creative Europe. And I must stress here that the Creative Europe Ireland desk really do a very interesting, very informative um, series of webinars and events um, about the value of international networks and the learning opportunities and the ways of um, how different organisations connect um, with uh, international colleagues. So that is um, really worth checking out. So, uh, so the first thing I want to say in this segment, I really want to talk about um, what I've learned. So these are just kind of quite quick takeaways. Um, and if you have comments or questions, please put them into the comment box below and we will be answering your questions live as well. So the first thing I really wanted to stress is the partnership. It's something that hasn't been covered yet through this Dissemination Lab series, but this partnership is extraordinary. Uh, to be in a cross-sectoral partnership, so we have a grassroots community space, two local government departments, a social enterprise, a regional cultural institution, and we all have very different ways of working and understanding and have different um, uh, approaches and understandings of the questions that we're addressing. So this was a huge learning opportunity for me and the, the importance of um, cross-sectoral partnership. And um, I'm going to start uh, very quickly with Ostend, just my, my quick takeaways from each place. Ostend were responsible for the evaluation and they introduced really um, lots of examples of good and best practice. And I actually find that in Limerick we have a lot of uh, very good examples, if not best examples, uh, or examples of best practice in projects that are happening here, but they are not written down. These models, these innovative models and community-led and community-focused projects, there isn't a written document recording what um, 
is happening, these achievements, and that's something that I, I would hope to address. Um, to our partners in Gdansk, really for me, the takeaway from Gdansk was the cumulative effect of artistic actions over time. That even though we were only there for a short week, we're part of a longer history, we're part of a greater conversation, and there's a greater time commitment required here and the importance of the discur these discursive events. So I would like to bring some of the methodologies that they adapted in looking at the Gdansk, the former Gdansk shipyard, and applying them in Limerick and looking at some of the sites that, that I listed previously and inviting communities to use Ormston House as a space to have these conversations and to, to open that up. Um, in Govan, um, networking our community groups better. We have really wonderful um, community organizations in Limerick. And I found in Govan, they were really connected, really interconnected. They really promoted each other. They really knew what each other were doing. And at the moment in Limerick, something which is really important is we've, uh, we're starting to, um, to uh, reintroduce the Limerick public participation. So this is an opportunity for community groups across the city and county to inform council policy. So to give ideas, to give feedback um, to local government on policy development. So actually as a result of this project, um, not only is Wormston House a member of a number of linkage groups in different uh, special areas of focus, but actually just recently I put myself forward for election and was elected to one of the strategic um, policy committees to do with community leisure and culture and it's just to be directly involved you know to have that open communication with the local government but also to bring the ideas of the community groups to a council level to the attention of the the council and to get that that um uh, conversation to be very robust around the uh, future policy decisions um and of course levadia uh, which was our very first uh uh, research residency location and a really key thing which I've always prided myself in Ireland around hospitality but the Greeks just really you know blew us out of the water and you know I don't say this lightly or merely in jest actually the European Commission has awarded the town for its reception of asylum seekers and for their inter integration uh, programs and also for the cultural diversity in such a small town to have embraced people who are fleeing uh, war-torn um, parts of the Middle East and further afield as well. So really an extraordinary example of European solidarity um, in this very small uh, town in, in Greece with a huge heart. And it was an absolute joy to, to be there and to meet the people. And finally, this series, the Dissemination Labs, which was the responsibility of our lead partner, Intercult, and my thanks to Ivona Price for including us in this uh, project. And something that we've definitely learned from the Intercult is actually sharing our achievements, which I think something Ormson House probably hasn't been as good at in the past. And I think maybe some of us in Limerick could really learn from as well. We do, there's a lot of good stuff happening in Limerick. Um, and I don't think we sing about our achievements even nearly enough. So. Um, those are my principal uh, takeaways of the learnings that I have from each of the partners. But most importantly has been the artists. I've learned the most from the artists and I couldn't possibly summarize uh, in such a short space of time, but I just want to take the opportunity to thank T.S. Bell, Ira Brami, Siegfried Vink, Jonas Meerstrand and Devona Zients. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing the Irish artist who uh, worked with us and represented Ormston House on the project, Mary Conroy. My name is Mary Conroy and I am an artist uh, from Kilkenny but in Limerick 20 years so I'm from Limerick now at this stage I think. I was asked to do this uh, the year before last, it was late 2018 and the council bought this site and uh, I don't know what the plans are for it yet but this space was derelict, there was a, a, a yard here and they knocked a building so this wall was bare and they want to have something in the meantime to make it a bit more interesting, a bit more, have a bit more life in the place, I suppose. So I decided to base it on uh, the River Shannon and the salmon, really, because a lot of my own work is about the River Shannon, about wildlife, about urban nature and urban biodiversity and how we connect with it. But this space was also used as a salmon packing plant. That building behind us was a salmon packing plant. They used to catch the fish on the weir here. Um, I had a, a meeting with the residents uh, in late 2018 and we had a, a chat about what what they would like to see here, their memories of the space, what a piece of public art would, would work here, what kind of image they'd like to see and um, 
met with them a couple of times and came up with some designs and we decided that it really it would be something to do with the river itself because a lot of people grew up here it's a very old neighborhood it's a really lovely neighborhood i love i love Thorngate. it's a really really old neighborhood so a lot of people remember when this this was a working factory a lot of people call this site the distillery site as well there used to be a whiskey distillery here um, which I thought was kind of interesting. But it all, again, the whiskey was here because the water comes from the Shannon. So it's really, it's a connection with the river itself. And I think for me, the salmon, because it's got such a, a history, it's got so, it's, there's so much folklore with it. Um, and it's really, it's really special. And they're really in decline now as well. So I kind of, I want to put these up here. So t to connect the community with their past, with the, with the industry that was here, with the river itself, with nature, and to try and keep it as something Something kind of calm as well, you know? I mean, there's houses right across the road that have to open their curtains and look at this every day. So I wanted to keep it keep it connected to the space, very, very definitely connected to the history of the space, the industry of the space. We did a workshop as part of Make a Move Festival um, in Ormston House last summer, uh, where members of the public were invited to come. Some of the people that I'd met at the residence meeting came along and they made some of the fish themselves. So it was kind of a way to get people involved in the actual making process, but to have a kind of ownership of the space itself, but also to let people be an artist and let people create and make. So the, the you know, I made molds for the salmon and people came and they filled the molds with clay, we pulled them out and they made the stencils and cleaned them and dried them. And it was, it was great actually. I, I had a lot more people show up than I was expecting. And uh, it was really nice to be able to share that experience of making with people. Because people don't get to make a whole lot, especially with ceramics, because it's such a specialised material. So it was really lovely to, to allow people or to help people. Well, people helped me and I helped them, I suppose, to uh, create these works. And then to have it have it on the wall here, I think, is, is kind of special. I live just up the road from here, so I get to cross the river every day. I love it. Every time I walk past it, it's different. The high tides and the low tides. Seen it recently with the spring tides and it was so low, it was like a beach. It was the, half the town right there it was gorgeous it was like a beach in the city you know to go and explore that space and especially with the lockdown because we could only go two kilometers but i mean go two kilometers either side of thumman bridge would be just up the road here very near to me two kilometers either side of that is an adventure you know especially with the water and the wildlife and uh there's a really lovely walk on king's island here you know you can see the swans it's it's gorgeous it's it's a breath of fresh air as well right through the city um, so I just think I think I think we need to celebrate it a bit a bit more, but also the wildlife that's in it. You know, people think of the, the river as something to be used, but you know, it, it's its own entity as well. It's its own life, and it's it's been around far longer than most of us. And so have these fish, so have these salmon. You know, the Abbey fishermen were fishing as far back as the 1300s. Like I think that's amazing, and that's how important these animals, these fish, were to this city. You know, it was a whole industry. Yeah, I I just think it's something that we need to remember. And think about because it. it's i just think we have such short memories in the way things are at the moment i think it's good to remember the importance not just that everything is for us to use but that everything is its own being in itself as well you know this was all here before us and we, exactly. we think we own it all Hi Mary, how are you? <laughs> Good Mary, how are you? It was lovely to, to look back and uh, remember the installation of, of that work. I, I was reminded um, of the fact that you had painted that very large wall blue and then you had changed the colour and then the lady who lived across the road told you that she preferred the first colour. So you and I went down on a Sunday and, <laughs> and repainted it back to the, the original um, uh, blue and I think this is an, is an important point because it was so important to you that this that the community had input into what happened in this space and I know you had a second part uh, that we you know before COVID we were planning to um, to shoot as well of this process and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah sure <clears throat> excuse me uh, yeah, it was absolutely lovely to look back at that video and just remember all that sunshine that we had here during the summer when you think about the, the weather we're having now. But uh, yeah, to spend that time in that space 
Um, and talking about the the input communities have, I mean, I'm, I mean, there's there's three houses directly across from that space, and. What was wonderful about working there was I got to chat to everybody as they walked past. I got to chat to the people that would walk past there every day. And even throughout the process of making that, of choosing the colors, making the fish beforehand, I was still open to change throughout the making and the installation process. And I had some great chats with the, the lady across the road who uh, much prefers lighter blues. And as you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of who this work is for, who is the audience for this. And as I say, she has to open her curtains every day and look at this. So for me, I think, I don't think it's a compromise in my work. I don't think it's a compromise that the, 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 this work doesn't look exactly like I had designed it. I think it makes it a little bit better because it, it's, it becomes a co-produced work. Um, so this piece for me, this, this artwork for me, I don't consider it to be completely my work. I think I facilitated, I instigated it. I work as an artist. I work as a, you know, as a trained artist um, to have these technical skills, have aesthetic skills. But at the same time, um, I bring people with me on that journey. And there's, I, I always think that it's really important to have a skill share in this kind of work and to have active participation where people can make decisions with me, where we have those conversations, not even beforehand, but actually on site and throughout the process. Um, so really for me, this work, uh, this, this, this artwork, this mural, the street art, whatever you want to call it, isn't, isn't quite finished um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's been a lot of planting done in the area out the front. Uh, you can kind of see in that video that there's a, a area of plain soil. Since that film was shot, it's been planted with some oak trees and it's been seeded with wildflowers. So really that work won't actually be finished until next summer when those flowers grow. So it's going to change it completely to, to bring that life into it, to bring that wildness in it, to bring the, the, the animals from the river, from the local area, the butterflies, the bees, the birds into that area, to bring an actual life into that space is what's really important for me. Um, so really, I haven't seen it finished yet. Nobody's actually seen it finished yet. But also, as, as you mentioned there about uh, the second part of that film, which we had planned to do, but of course, COVID. Uh, I, yeah, I was in touch with the council and what we wanted to do was have an official opening for it. And I was, that's the bit that I was really excited about, mm. was because it would be a chance to bring everybody together into that space. Um, so I would be closed for quite some time and it's recently passed into the ownership of the council as well. So obviously they need to start generating plans for it. And I know you really wanted to get the ideas of the local community about what they would like to see there. Yeah. Well, previous to actually installing the work, I had some meetings with the local community. I met quite a few people, actually. I had some meetings with the local residents association. Um, some of the local politicians were there, the planners, a couple of guys from the council that we all got together and we met in the local pub. Um, and with the public, and because if you open the door of the local pub, you see that straight across the road. So they, for me, these are the stakeholders. These are the very important people um, that this work is for. They have to look at it every day. Uh, so yeah, the plan is to have an official opening and get all of these people down, get the, the, the lady that lives across the road, the guys that pass up and down every day. There's another house right beside that space. I spoke to them every day. The planners, the politicians were to come together and have that official opening where we could have a chat, have a, have a chat. And everybody could meet each other face to face because I think that's really important. I think sometimes when people talk about the council, it's kind of this nameless, faceless, entity that 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 has all this power but it's not they're people they're people doing a job and i find that if you talk to somebody they really will listen you know i think it's it's building those bridges it's creating those connections and i think that's what we do as artists particularly in the memory of water project i think that's the whole point of it is that we become this bridge or we become this this event or this stepping stone to bring people together, even if it's only temporary as it is in Lavadia or Gdansk or Govan, we're there temporarily, but we create that bridge. And I think it's what, what happens then is the partners can, can, can keep those connections going after we leave. And that's what I would like to see happen here, but we didn't have the opportunity, of course, because of COVID and the restrictions. 
um, to really kind of finalize that or, or make it into the, the second part to, to cross that bridge where everybody can kind of come together, you know, in that space. But like I said, it's not over and I'm hoping we're still in to we're still talking about having an official opening, hopefully next summer when we have um, an easing of restrictions and the plants will have grown by then, the trees will have grown by then. So maybe the work will be a little bit more towards being finished mm. and it might give us a, a bit more insight as well to what can happen next. I think it seems really obvious to to state this, but it's something that's really remarkable remarkable about your work is that the inclusion of this kind of conversations with the community, the work is always much better received. You know, when you have these initial conversations, gather ideas, everyone shares their ideas, and then people under you're on that journey with the local community. So the work is well received. They have their input. It's changed, of course, if they are looking for changes or adaptations that you're really open to that and you brought that skill set I think really really well to memory of water um as well do you think your participation in memory of water has adapted or mm -hmm. honed any particular skills or do you think you you know you had brought these skills and were able to adapt them to new context was it a two-way <laughs> I think it um I think I've definitely brought the skills with me and been able to adapt them to a new context um, but it also kind of made me understand a bit more about the, the idea of the long term impacts of things like this and how they're measured. I've always I've always wondered how the impact of these can be measured. You know, as I said, we go and we do something and then we're gone. Um, so I guess for me, what's what I what I've learned from this is the importance of the network around a project like this. Not just, you know, I, I'm quite used to working in isolation. A lot of artists work on their own. Whereas with this, there's such a big network between the six partners and the six other artists. And then every time we go to a city, there's the production team. And then there's the communities of interest. So for me, it was really great to be able to understand the importance of that network and the support that we can have and how much better a project like this can be really with the more people that are involved and the more communications that you have with everybody that's involved. So that's something that I'm definitely going to bring back with me and something that I want to bring back to this particular project and any of my future projects was to understand that importance of network and keeping those lines of communications open. So that it's not just an event where we go in and do something and then leave, so that we can actually understand that legacy and, and the impact for the future. I think that's a, um, you know, something that I have really found as well. So as you know, because we couldn't host the artists um, gathering here in Limerick, unfortunately, that we, we adapted our programme and I've hosted a series of podcasts interviewing the artists and, and the curators in each of the cities. And it's been really interesting for me to hear now, looking back at the, this very short time period that you're there, but like from their perspective, what changes have happened or the benefits of, you know, um your actions and activities in in the different places and i have to say i'm quite surprised that even in this like very soon after some of these activities just how meaningful it has been you know because i think this is a very experienced team of artists um you know it's not a, you're not emerging like you're very secure in your practices you all have a very sophisticated way of working and you've never made claims on behalf of any of the communities you know like it was very much they decide as well um you know mm. The impacts for them so it's been really lovely in the podcast series um just to hear from the different you know um participants what has happened after we've gone because we we wouldn't know yeah. that otherwise you know so to hear that i think has been been wonderful and, and i agree with you um and yeah. i also think that this idea of the cumulative effect of like all the different artists working is something that i've really learned from this process as well that nothing is an isolation like you said we're a node in a network we all hold a piece of the story so, to, so to absolutely speak. absolutely and that's why i'm really looking forward to hearing those podcasts because i've left this project this project is winding down it's not finished i think the the fact that we didn't get to have that artist gathering in limerick is a huge loss to all of us but also to limerick to have those urban labs we've had those urban labs in each of the cities we've gone to and they've just been amazing because like that it gets all of those people in a room and it gets all of those people heard. And I think people really just want to be heard. They want to get their side of the story out. And that's what a project like Memory of Water does. It is it allows those voices from all sides to come together and be heard. So it gives like that, it gives a face to community, it gives, it gives a voice to communities. I'm not talking about underprivileged communities, I'm not talking about 
uh, communities of place. I'm talking about all of these stakeholders that we have, like the council as a community or the partners and their production teams as a community in themselves, that we all have this role and we all have this idea of what we are doing or what should be. And I really do think it, it allows that space for change, changes of opinion, changes of ideas, changes of direction. I, I genuinely do think that it has a, a, an influence. Everybody can have that influence on, on each other once they're, once they're heard, once they are allowed to speak and they are heard. I think that's the start of it. And it takes time. That's the other thing about projects like this. They do take time. I mean, we go and we do a project. But I mean, I can't, I can't possibly say what the legacy of any of my projects have been in Levadia, Gdansk or Greece, because it's too short, too short of a time. And that's what I'm, that, uh, coming back to what I was saying, that's what I'm excited to hear about these podcasts. I'm excited about these labs, the reports. I'm really looking forward to hearing those over time and for everybody having time to digest all this and understand what we have done. I don't think we're there yet. I, I know I'm certainly not there yet. And even with any of the projects, I think any socially engaged project, it, it, ta it needs time. It's not something that can be done in a week or two weeks or a month or even six months. Things like this take years. Absolutely. And do you think, like for yourself, what do you think you have benefited from this project? Are there particular skills or, I mean, something that I don't know if we have captured in uh, yet in terms of some of the events we've done is just the amazing bond between all the artists and, and their yeah. support you have for each other. And, you know, you, it, it's impossible to plan something like that, just how supportive mm -hmm. you were of each other, um, the conversations that were very interesting. You all have very, very different um, approaches to participation and very different practices. Um, but that's something that I hope some that we we start to capture that um as well you can't bottle that you know um but what do you think that you how you how did you personally you know as an artist benefit do you think uh well for me I think one of the biggest things is to really understand different approaches to what social engaged art is what participation is what co-production is what co, -co creation is because these are words that are starting to get used a lot more regularly um, in in art practices um, and just the the diversity of these practices even in the small amount of of artists that we had there there were six artists with very very different approaches but all with very very valid outcomes and very very valid um, uses of different strands of participation co-production uh, socially engaged art and for me, that was a really, really big eye opener um, just to see those different approaches and how effective they were in different ways with different communities. And I thought that was amazing because we did all have very quite different practices. Um, and I think that's what made it work is that we had a lot to give each other. We had a lot to share with each other. We had a lot to learn from each other. And even just down to skills and techniques and things like very practical things like, you know, Siegfried's, you know, I watched I watched him do a spray can demo with the Levadia, um, the guys in Levadia, and I was blown away. I've never seen anybody do that. I've never seen anybody as skilled like that. So for me, I, it was a deeper understanding of practices, styles, materials, even down to materials, and how other people work and how other people approach the same brief, looking for the same outcomes. Um, and for me, that was a big learning. Um, also, I have I, I made some great friendships. So, I mean, that's something, like you say, you can't bottle it. And I think that, that the reason for that is because we do have such different approaches and we do have such different practices that we were able to work in tandem with each other. You know, and I, I really don't think there was any ego. You know, I think we all left at the door and got on with it and got, and got to work. And I think that's what was really, really special about this. And that's something that I really learned from it. I think you all had such a, a strong sense of responsibility of how could your present each place be useful how you know and you really listen to the communities and their stories because i think it'd be a difficult to la arrive in a place for a short period of time you know and um to try and do something impactful like as you say but i think the communities were so open and welcoming and you know and we're really proud of their their cities i'm thinking in particular at the moment our very first one in, in levadi where we were just like really embraced and um I think uh, the, the artists really, to my mind, I mean, I learned a lot from all, all of the artists. Um, you know, it was a, really a privilege to, to work with this team. But um, you all had such a strong sense of responsibility to that place and doing something useful, as I said. And 
yeah. impactful and um I, like you said, I, I think that was an important, like all of you had that sense of responsibility towards the, yeah. the place, you know. But I think as well, that's what I, coming back to what I said earlier on about the partners. I mean, I think everybody was so, so generous with their time and so generous with their information that I, I, I think we all really felt like we had to give something back in a generous way. And we did. I think everybody that was there worked really hard and, and really believed in what we were doing. Um, and the connections that were, were put in front of us through the research residency um, by the curators and partners in each country were really beneficial. I mean, we, our eyes were open to so many different aspects of these cities and we were given so many options or so many ideas or so many directions we could go in and we were pretty much given free reign to, to do whatever we want. And we were supported so well by the partners and by the production teams. That's something that I, I hadn't really experienced before as well, just that, that support you know, that there was somebody there if we needed help that we, you know, somebody could point us in the right direction. And the communities that we met and the citizens of the countries, the, the, the cities that we met were so helpful to us and so open and so kind. And the hospitality that we experienced was fantastic. You know, on a, a genuinely, genuinely, it was, it was a great experience in that sense. It, it, it really was. I, I felt the same as well. And uh, I learned a lot throughout the process. I mean, there were things we we learned from each other. We all had, um, I think, at the beginning, slightly different understandings of things like participatory practice. Yeah. And it was really interesting to to figure out how we all understood our role, how we all understood what we were trying to do and achieve. And we all worked in, in slightly different ways, and uh, I think I learned a lot um, yeah. uh, from the partners as well as 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 the artists. Um, so I mean, I, I, it, it's kind of amazing where we're drawing to a to a close now. But I really feel there's a lot left to be done. I think um, mm. that sense of responsibility and also starting to unpack some of the the impacts and the the legacies that this project has had. I think we all know there's there's more to be done here. And like you said, we need like more time. And we're really seeing the effectiveness of bringing you know. Um, participatory practice and really skilled and very established artists into this kind of conversation like you said been a connector of different communities and planning process and um, you know decision makers and I, I would love to see a continuation of this project and maybe think on a bigger scale on a longer longer periods of, of time and um, I think our work even though this is drawing to a close I think it's, it's a good moment to stop and reflect but I think we're very much committed to looking to the future and continuing this conversation. And I know certainly in terms of Wormston Heights, we're bringing all that learning back to Limerick. Um, and like you said, that this particular site could be an interesting place to, oh, to, to let Wormston Heights be a space for people to meet and, and, and talk and um, share their, their ideas and dreams. Um, you know, as Roman was, uh, Roman Sebastianski, the, the curator in, Poland was really keen to collect people's dreams and um, I just thought that was a lovely way of, of putting it um, yeah. you know so yeah I'm kind of interested about next steps where do, where do we go from here and I don't know if you'd, you've thought about that or if you're just like let me you know close one out before well, no, this is the, I know I have thought about it and I agree with you Mary I think I think there is a lot left in this and I think there's a lot more to do but I don't know what the next step is because this is the time for reflection and I don't think we, we, we can know that yet until we stop for a minute and have a look at these things and then maybe take a bit of time and, and, and see what happens next and maybe make the plans for the future because it's been pretty intense. I mean, it's been a lot of work, you know, and, and the, the production residencies, the research residencies, they are full on. And it takes, for, well, for me, it takes time to absorb that and to assimilate that and to see what it actually means and how to apply those learnings to whatever happens next but I absolutely agree it does it does feel like it was cut short and we, we haven't quite finished yet exactly. it's really uh, on that note as well like next week we have a common lab on the 16th of uh, December so Intercult the project leader is hosting a common lab so all the artists and partners will be together in one zoom room uh, and we're all going to be sharing just short reflections on what we've achieved as a European project and together and you know, there'll be a short Q and A for people who are interested to to see all the artists and partners together and how that dynamic uh, worked over the past two years. And then after that, we're going to have a, a private meeting as well, just to kind of, like you said, to reflect on that and 
then um, we have the the reporting and evaluation to do and I think we'll be ready for next steps then I think we're all yeah. kind of excited we we need that moment to to pause and, and reflect on it but for me the impact is like the, the project doesn't finish here like I'm bringing a lot of that learning with me back back to Limerick so um Mary thank you so much I'm looking forward to our next chat on the 16th of December and for people mm. who are interested in hearing about the individual projects that each of the artists made in the the three cities the podcast will be available at ormstonhouse.com and memoryofwater.eu and you can find about more about mary's work there also uh, mary thank you so much for joining me today and i'm looking forward to seeing you soon you too mary thank you bye bye